You're listening to the First Baptist Rockdale Sunday Sermons Podcast. First Baptist Rockdale is a church dedicated to making disciples who make disciples. We hope you enjoy this week's message. Uh, we're going through the book of Hebrews. Uh, I had uh, uh, an interesting conversation just a couple weeks ago. Uh, my father-in-law was in town, I guess, probably because Seth was here a couple weeks ago. And so uh, they came in to see uh, Seth since he was back from college for, for a couple days. And uh, he talked to me afterwards, and he said, man, I love the book of Hebrews. And I said, yeah, it's great. Uh, and he's like, man, there's some, there's some tricky stuff in there, though. And I was like, yeah, no, look at me. He's like, he's like, like chapter 6? And I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 there's stuff there. In chapter 6, which is what we're going to cover uh, a large part of that today, actually all of chapter 6 and the end of chapter 5 today, man, there is some tricky stuff in there. Chapter 6 uh, deals with the issue of apostasy. And apostasy is a kind of a $5 church word that means walking away from the faith, uh, you know, to, to renounce the faith uh, altogether. Uh, and then how that works uh, inside a Baptist belief of, you know, once saved, always saved, or perseverance of the saints, or however you want to uh, term that kind of Baptist distinctive. Uh, and, and I'll tell you what it is. It's a difficult passage. Uh, it's, it's a hard message to hear. Uh, it's a hard message to study, and it's going to be a hard message to preach, but, but, uh, but I pray that God will be glorified as we do that. We're at the end of Hebrews chapter 5, uh, starting in verse 11, and this is what uh, the author of Hebrews says in 5. About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Okay, so when he actually gets to Hebrews chapter 5, 11, he begins to talk uh, about this dichotomy of, of spiritual food between milk and solid food. And if you've ever raised a child, you know there is a, there's a break. Right from a child when they were they were young babies still nursing or, or, or on a bottle, and then all of a sudden they start eating solid food, and then the milk begins to wean away, and then all of a sudden, man, it's all sitting out at the dinner table making a mess with what, whatever it is that y'all are eating that day. And see, solid food is natural to grow into; it is unnatural to remain on milk forever. If you have a four-year-old whose primary diet is still nursing, there's a problem there. And I know there are mothers who nurse like really long. Like I saw, I don't know if it was Time Magazine or something years ago. It was like a lady like nursing, like bre- it was kind of a pro breastfeeding thing, I think. But like, she's like holding a kid who's like that long, like nursing. And I'm like, how? Like, I don't know what that means. Cause I don't know how old that kid was in that process, but it's unnatural for that to be their primary source of food uh, as they get older. Right, so I don't, I'm not here to give parenting advice about when you should begin to wean your kid and start with the rice cereal and move on to the squash that's been all squashed up. Right, that's not my that's not my role here. I just say that if you've got a ten year old and they're still nursing or you're mixing up a bottle of formula for all their meals, you are doing them a serious disservice. Right, they can never grow to what they're supposed to do because they're missing out on all the nutrients, all the good things that solid food has to give them. This is not directly related, but it works. My wife taught in a large uh, Mother's Day Out program uh, in the Humble area, just outside of Kingwood. There's a big, big Baptist church there she was at. And there was a kid who was like four years old and had no real teeth. All of their real teeth had rotted out. And the reason all the real teeth had rotted out and they had like porcelain teeth or whatever was the mother or grandmother, whoever was in charge of this kid, gave the child apple juice only whenever they wanted it. And so this kid lived on apple juice plus, I mean, they ate some real food as well, but all of those sugars just slowly destroyed it because it wasn't the right nourishment for that person, right? And in the Bible, we hear about solid food and milk, and the idea is like some of us, when we're new in the faith, all of us need the foundational principles of our faith. Right? And really what the beginning of Hebrews does is it lays out a lot of those foundational principles for our faith. Who is Jesus? What is distinct about Jesus? What is unique about Jesus as opposed to any other person that's come before or who's going to come after? What is it that makes Jesus unique? 
But you know what? If that's all you ever learn about the will of God and the words of God and what God is teaching you, you're always going to be immature. Right? There are deeper things. There's greater truth. And this isn't some secret hidden truth, some Gnostic truth that's hidden away. There is truth that's plainly evident throughout Scripture. But if we neglect that to hold on to just the very elementary teachings only, you'll never develop fully into what God wants you to to be. You'll be a Christian for sure, but you'll never mature in a meaningful way. And there's a lot of Christians who never mature in a meaningful way. There's a couple reasons for that. One is they seek out teaching that is always milk. Right? There are churches that are dedicated to always milk teaching. I'm not going to name too many names today, right? But, but if you were to live in Houston where I grew up and you were to go to Lakewood, consistently as your only source of truth from God's Word. Look, like I've got all sorts of issues with Joel Osteen. I know people who've been saved through the ministry of Lakewood uh, because Joel has told them like, that, that Christ is the way to salvation, that God loves them enough to send Jesus to die for them. His gospel presentation get a little, little icky if you really want to get too deep into it. But if you live under the teaching of that only, you will never grow into spiritual maturity. Right? But if you get out of that, even if that was your stepping stone into the faith, and you get out of that and you go somewhere else, right, you can find growth in the process. Right? That was, that's just my hometown. I imagine that there's pastors, by the way, if you're a popular pastor, people emulate you. So there's countless pastors who look up to, to, to a ministry like what is going on at Lakewood and say, man, that's what I want to target my church after. Right? That's kind of what I want my church to be structured like and so you only get this kind of uh, milk all the time and there are people who seek that out there are christians who seek out just to be told god loves you jesus is god's son and he died for you and that's all you need to know and every sunday is the same message packaged a different way to tell you like god loves you and jesus died for you and this is my bible right and now we'll move on right and then we'll do it again next sunday and we'll just repackage it again but it's basically God loves you, you know, Jesus died for you, and this is my Bible. And then we'll move on again, and we'll do it again, and again, and again. We'll tell a different joke this week than we did last week. We'll have a different little story this week than we had last week. But the message is always milk. You never get into sin, the nature of sin, how sin destroys you. You never get into righteous living. You never get into the, the, the meat of sanctification. You're never dealing with troubling passages like Hebrews chapter 6, uh, because you don't have to. Someone asked me one time, why do I preach through books of the Bible? Uh, Andy Stanley, who I have a, a, a love-hate relationship with Andy, uh, but Andy Stanley you know, said that, that the way I preach, the uh, expository book through book preaching, is lazy. He's a topical preacher. He gives you a topic. He covers a topic uh, aggressively, and then he moves to something else. Uh, and I think, well, it's probably lazy, Andy, uh, for, 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 for you, right? Because you've got a team of 15 people <laughs> working all the time to, to make these things Nice and simple for you. But the reason I preach straight through a book of the Bible, the reason I go through the book of Hebrews, the reason I go through the book of Joshua, the reason I go through the book of Ecclesiastes, God bless you, the reason I go through all those things is so I can't skip things that I don't want to say to you. Right? There are messages in God's Word that are not palatable to your ears today and difficult for me to tell you. Right? So whenever I get into Jesus' teaching uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, everything, Matthew 5 through 7, is difficult for you to hear and difficult for me to say. Like even the nice things, like the things like that, you're like, oh, well, this is pretty, pr pretty, pretty simple. It's still hard to hear and it's hard to say because it's so, it's so harsh, right? Righteous living is so much further than this kind of like baseline obedience. That's why I preach the way I do, so I can't skip things. Like it'd be nice for me to go to Hebrews chapter 7 today. And in fact, if I was preaching the book of Hebrews and like, Eight weeks, I probably could have done that. Like, yeah, you know, chapter 6 is this. Let's just go to chapter 7. We'll pick up there. Right? And then when chapter 10 comes and hits it again, I'll be, yeah, we'll go to chapter 11. Right? Because you can skip around. Yeah, Hall of Faith. Look, there you go. Remember you know, Abraham and all these great witnesses. Yeah, that'd be great. A lot of witnesses. Right? Hit the highlights. When you do that, you do a disservice. There's people who seek that out. There's preachers who, who exploit that, recognize there's people who want that, and just give it to them even though they know it's not good for them. I have no doubt that there are preachers who stand up every Sunday, refuse to give their people meat, even though they know their people need meat, because they really don't want to offend anyone out there today. 
Another issue is a lot of people in churches today, the only Bible teaching they get takes place inside of the church. Whether in a Sunday school class or in a small group or in a sermon. By the way, if this message, these 30-ish minutes, ish, minutes that I talk on any given Sunday is your full exposure to God's word for the course of the week, you will never mature spiritually. Right? That's not to say that I'm not a decent preacher. I think I can be okay on any given Sunday. But I cannot do in 30 minutes to 100 people what God can do with you in five minutes a day in his word. You need to open his word. You need to study his word. Some of you are spiritually immature, craving milk, because you have never seriously taken the time to open God's word and say, God, speak to me. Teach me from your word. You've never done it. Or maybe you started it, and then you said, like, New Year's resolution style, man, I'm going to do it, and then you, you bite off this huge chunk, I'm going to read through the Bible in the year, it takes four chapters a day, it's really not that hard, but you know what, if you're a week behind, and all of a sudden you're 28 chapters behind, you're like, I can never catch up. Been there, done that, I know it. So what do you do in that situation when you're six books behind on your Bible reading plan in October? You open your Bible, and you read today right a lot of us are, are spiritually immature because we've never taken time to own the fact that you are responsible for your own theology it's one of my favorite sayings from duff mcduffie caleb mcduffie was our youth pastor here his dad was my favorite sunday school teacher that i had working under me at kingwood bible church and duff would teach our uh, 10th and 11th graders at my church there in kingwood uh, and he's and he would ask this question like i don't know every month he says, who is responsible for your theology? Is it me? Is it, is it the pastor? With that case, with Woody. Is it Matt? Is it your parents? And then he says, no, you're responsible for your own theology. This is going to be important today, by the way. You're responsible for your theology. You're responsible for knowing what you believe, why you believe, and then where it comes from in God's word. Right? You're responsible. I have a responsibility to teach rightly. Oh, dear Lord, do I have a responsibility to teach rightly? But you're responsible for hearing God's word, reading God's word, and forming your own theology, right? And I pray that it becomes orthodox in the process of being refined by, by people who love you, right? But, but you're responsible for that. Guys, we need solid food. As a church, we need solid food. We cannot live on milk alone. I look over there, I see little Bonnie just eating a bottle. I'm like, that works great for Bonnie, right? Because she's Six months old or so right now. How old is she? Did I get it right? Man, I'm a good pastor. I mean, <laughs> I hold the babies are in the church. Pretty good guy right here. So, right? Right? Six, six month old. Yeah, six month old needs, needs the bottle. Yeah, she needs it. But some of y'all are 66 years old. 76 years old. 36 years old. And you, you're still, you're still struggling. We've got to get the foundations down for sure, but you can't live on this, this milk alone. You'll never develop into what you're supposed to do. Going down to chapter 6, it says, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrines. This is a scary phrase, by the way. He's like, so transitioning away from that milk, now we're about to get serious. So let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works of faith toward God and of instructions about washings and the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Those are the basics, right? Which is a lot of basics, right? Because like as you read it, you're like, oh my goodness, yeah, Christ, uh, right? Let's uh, go on to maturity, not laying in fact, repentance, faith, instructions about washings. What's our rules on that, including baptism, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead. What is that? How's that going there? Eternal judgment. These are, this is Christianity 101. All of that stuff, we're leaving that behind because we're going to focus on something slightly, slightly more, 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 more uh, difficult, meatier, as it were. And this we will do if God permits. Verse 4, it says, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance." since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing 
from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name and in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So he deals, dives straight into apostasy, and this is the claim that the writer of Hebrews makes. He says, it is impossible for those, starting in verse, I don't know, four-ish, right, or five-ish, uh, yeah, four, says it's impossible for those who have tasted all of these things, who have been a part of all of this stuff, who, who have been in this, have, have, have shared, uh, or what is it, shared in the Holy Spirit, tasted the goodness of the Word uh, of God, for them to have fallen away and then to come back again to repentance. This is a scary statement. This is scary because that means that if you have come into, and that's most of you, by the way, are, are in this world of danger here because you're at church today. Welcome, good to have you. Uh, right? The idea is, if you are to willfully walk away, knowing everything, experiencing the goodness of God, tasting the goodness of God and the greatness of God and the salvation that comes with it, being a partaker of the community of saints inside of the church, it, it's impossible to have someone who's in that world to put their hand up and to walk away and to come back. That's not to say... That it's impossible for anyone uh, to, to, to lapse. Right? This is not a statement about lapsed Christians. We've all, if we're honest with ourselves, had moments where we have lapsed from uh, true faith. Our obedience has been suboptimal. That means bad, I think. Right? We've had bad obedience. Right? We've known the righteous path. We've seen what we're supposed to do. We've still chosen the wrong path. Right, but, but God is still working on us and convicting us. I've had people come to me and say, I don't know what to do with that because I'm struggling with the sin and I'm working through these things. And, and what does that mean for me? And I think if you're struggling through sin, like if you're struggling with sin, that's a good sign that God is still working on your heart. Right? Because there's a lot of people who have no struggle at all with sin. Right? They just choose it. And they love it. And it's everything that they want. There are people who high-handedly walk away from the faith. It's easier to see in high-profile circumstances, but it happens every day inside of the church at large. There are people who have been a part of the community of faith, and, and I think like a good example for this, to get your minds to understand what this looks like, is like think about Jesus in the parable of the, the soils or the parable of the sower. Right, Jesus uh, talks about a man, he goes out, he's casting seed, some seed falls on the path, it gets taken away by birds. Some seed falls on good ground, it grows and produces a harvest. And there's two other soils. There's soils that's rocky, and there's soils that's, you know, thir uh, thorns and thistles, um, briars. I just threw all thriers is a word that I just made up. Um, you know, it goes into the weeds, right? And it may grow up with the weeds, but the weeds choke it out. And the things that grow in the, in the, in the rock, you know, they, they, they spring up real aggressively. They don't have any place to put their root because the rock doesn't allow it to take root. And it withers away. Look, there are people inside of the church. There are people likely inside of this church community who look like disciples of Christ. Outward appearances. Right? They have a profession of faith. They've come down and they've made a profession of faith. They say, I profess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But they have no possession of faith. And maybe they go to church for, 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 for a variety of reasons. It makes them feel good uh, to be in the church, to sing the songs, to play a part in what's going on. They may be involved in teaching. They may be involved in leadership because we can't always tell. Right? They're involved in a variety of ways, but they have no possession of faith. They have a profession of faith. And a profession of faith is important, right? Saying Jesus is Lord is one of the, the crucial elements uh, of this thing that we, we, we start with salvation. To declare that is the stepping stones into faith. But just saying something doesn't make it true inside of your heart. Another parable Jesus tells is the parable of the wheat and the tares. 
And the idea is like a man plants a harvest uh, of wheat, and he goes out and he plants the wheat, and it looks like a good field, but uh, overnight his enemy goes out into his field and throws weeds out there, tares among the wheat. And a few days or weeks later, as the stuff begins to germinate and sprout up, um, and as soon as you're able to differentiate, because at the very beginning you can't necessarily differentiate the wheat from the tear, but as they grow, you're able to tell the difference. And as it gets tall enough, his servants, of the, the man of the servants of the field, go to the man and say, look, there's, there's weeds all throughout your field. Did you plant bad seed? And he said, no, I planted good seed, and any of mine did this. And they said, do you want us to pull it up? Do you want us to pull out all the, the, the tares so that the wheat can thrive? And he said, no. No, because if you do that, you'll uproot the wheat along with it. He basically just says, wait for the harvest. And at harvest time, there will be a great separating. Then he brings in the angels, says the angels will come with their winnowing forks and separate them. There are people inside of the church, inside the institution of Christianity, sometimes standing up as beacons speaking for Christianity, right? who are tares sown here by the enemy. Right, this is a tough teaching. This is not like... Yay, this is an optimistic-looking world, but it's true. Jesus talks about it repeatedly. There's a lot of people who have false professions of faith, right? But they have no possession of true saving faith. Jesus talks about the wheat and the tares, right? And what do we do, right? We, we wait until harvest. I preached that message years and years ago at Kingwood Bible Church, and here was my main idea for that message, right? A lot of times we think about what are we, what are we supposed to do? How do we fix this problem, and I said, look, your job as a Christian, hearing the message of the wheat and the tares, is to be the wheat, not the tares, and then wait for the harvest. Because harvest is coming. Your job is not to be the harvester, by the way, and to be the one to winnow out and separate everyone away, and oh, no, this person's not right, and this person's not right. Right? Wait. The angels will take care of that. Right? God has, has set them on the course to, to do that separating. Right, so, so we don't have to do that. Or it's just to be wheat and wait for the harvest. But guys, apostasy is possible. So how, did, how is it possible that someone can be in the church, be a part of the church, experience everything has the church has to say, and then walk away from the church? And we still hold to the confession, the basic Baptist confession, that says that if you're a child of God, if you're saved by grace through faith, that nothing can remove you from the hand of God. Right, because I believe that wholeheartedly, gun to my head. If you if you have true faith, right, if you believed on Jesus Christ for your salvation, that God is the secure of your salvation, not you. So your obedience doesn't lose your salvation. Right? Your disobedience doesn't lose your salvation. But I will say this: as time goes forward, sometimes we find out whether or not God truly is the author of our faith or something else was what we were putting our faith inside of. I think of guys like Josh Harris. He's probably the easiest one for me to point out. Josh Harris wrote a real influential book whenever I was uh, a high schooler. It was called I Kiss Dating Goodbye. It influenced an entire generation of people about don't date. That was kind of the, the point of the book. Don't date, court, whatever that is, right? Don't date, court, and, uh, and then you'll, you'll be okay. And he parlayed that book. He was a young man when he wrote the book, 18, 19, 20 years old. I don't know, some, some young guy when he wrote the book, maybe even a teenager still. He wrote the book, gained massive notoriety, uh, ended up working at a church uh, as like an elder at a church that had major scandals that came out inside of it. And then at the end of his story, which I guess has now been written by his own apostasy, he's walked away. He's thrown his hands up and he says, there's, there's, there's nothing here at all. He's partaken in all the fellowship. He's taken, uh, we're going to take Lord's Supper to get today. Right? He's partaken in it. He's been a part of it. He's been inside of it. He's been fully indoctrinated. He was influential inside of it. He'd be a leader. People looked up to him. People sought him out for advice and wisdom. Right? Someone put him as a pastor of their church. But at the end of the day, when, when the harvest was fully grown, he was revealed to be a tear among the wheat. And now that he has walked away, from that, right? The author of Hebrews says it is impossible to return. And you say, Matt, how is that? That like God is gracious, forgiving. Like, how is it impossible to return? And my answer is, like, I don't know. I don't know. 
Bible does speak about an uh, unforgivable sin, right? Blaspheming the Holy Spirit. To give, uh, to, to credit the work of the Holy Spirit to something else. See that in Matthew 11, 12, 13, somewhere in there. This idea of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, right? And I think that may be what that sin is. To be a part of the fellowship, to be in this, this work of what God is doing, to experience it all, to understand it all, and then to wholeheartedly say, no, I'm out, 100% out. And how do we know ultimately if someone can't come back? I guess it's that they die in unrepentance. That's how we know that they can't come back. Paul says in Romans, you know, they go out from us because they never were from us. There are people who leave the fellowship because they were never a part, truly, of the fellowship. And this church, I want you to understand this, this isn't problems for other people. This isn't a problem taking place in a church somewhere else. This is our problem that we have to understand today, that we have to do business with today. We need to examine ourselves, as Paul says. Examine yourself to find that you're in the faith. Do you only have a profession of faith? Is your profession of faith the totality of what you have? This, I walked the aisle when I was 12 years old, and I've been at church ever since. Right? Or do you have possession of faith? Do you understand that the deeper things, does it motivate you towards holiness and godliness? You can pick up in verse 13 of chapter 6. It says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and I'll multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the process. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes uh, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And what he says here is like, you know, God swears by himself because he is the highest of authorities and he tells the truth. He cannot lie. And he says, because of all of this, we hold fast to him. Because of who he is, because uh, of, of all of these things, we hold fast to him. How do you know if you're in the faith? How do you, how do you, when you're examining yourself to say like, am I truly in the faith or am I a tear? among the wheat because the truth is i don't always think the tares know that they're tares i think i think if they were to like go introspectively they would understand it but for the vast majority of us the church looks like what the church does and if you do the things the church does then you assume that you are what the church is supposed to be producing which is disciples and that's a tragic consequence sometimes of, 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 of like thinking that your religion is solely based on performance of the works of Christians. Like, did I go to church? Did I read my Bible? Did I give? Did I attend Sunday school? Did I, did I, did I, did I? Like, you're, we, we, we tell you that salvation is by grace through faith. We tell you that, right? We preach that to you. The Bible says it over and over and over again. But then we, we also tell you, like, Look at what Christians do and do these things, and, right? And, and so you can do the Christian things without ever having salvation by faith. And there's a lot of people who have got really into the Christian things, the church things. And I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm a churchman, so like I'm pro the church. But to lose sight uh, uh, of what is the real thing, right, the, the true kernel of your faith, which is faith in Jesus Christ, for your salvation and to mix that in in the mess of like ritualized obedience is dangerous sometimes because we can't separate the two which is why we're called to examine ourselves and to make sure that what we're holding fast to is not some sort of obedience not did you make the pastor happy 
Like, did you volunteer for all the right things? Did you sign up to work at Trunk or Treat? Did you go to a supper club? Are you attending a small group? Have you given today? Have you done this? Like, making me happy, like, fulfilling my expectations for what I need a church member to do does not make you a believer in Jesus Christ. It doesn't. Attending church and reading your Bible doesn't make you a believer. You don't make you a believer in Jesus Christ. It's in the name, believe in Jesus Christ. That's it. Don't put your faith in anything else. Right? Like, uh, I love the way, way Paul says it. Like, like, he says, if Christ didn't raise from the dead, I'm to be pitied more than any other man in the world because my faith is solely set there. If today it was proven, some videotape, I don't know, I don't know why they had video back in ancient Jerusalem, but it was fixed at the cross of Jesus Christ, and we saw Jesus die, and the videotape followed him to the grave, and we watched the grave, and the grave never opened, and the body never emerged, and there was never an empty tomb. If you could watch all of that and then be like, oh man, that kind of stinks, but I still kind of got the church stuff figured out, you have missed Christianity. Because if it's not true that Christ raised from the dead, none of this matters. You would be better off going to the fair. Honestly. You would be better off going to the fair or, you know, pre-gaming for the Cowboys or, God forbid you if you have to pre-game for the Texans. I've been giving the Cowboys a lot of stink. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Man. Yeah. Yeah. But you'd be better off doing anything else. You know, going for a walk in the park, you know, petting your dog or goat or whatever it is that you got, your new pig, right? For pig owners over there in the corner, right? right? You would be better off doing anything, literally anything than this. Because this is an utter and complete waste of your time if the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not true. And if you're not convinced that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that true, if it doesn't bother you that it may not be true, if you read some guy on the internet who's like, well, you know, da 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 and you're like, oh, okay, I can see the argument there, you're probably not converted. You're probably not converted. It should bother you. You should have hope in nothing else except the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the power that comes through Christ conquering death in the grave. And so we hold fast to that truth because Christ is your only salvation. Nothing else. Not this, not not taking communion in a minute, not getting baptized behind me, not attending, being a deacon, serving as a pastor. None of that leads to salvation only holding fast to Christ, who is our salvation. So guys, what do you do today with this hard message? You go home and you examine your faith. You seriously examine your faith because there are people in the church, likely in this church, who have no faith at all. It's got something. Feels okay. I like the way church makes me feel. I like the songs, some of them at least, right? I like, I like when the guy gets up there and tells me God loves me. That kind of feels nice. God does love you, by the way. So you feel good about something today. That kind of feels nice. You know, when I put a couple coins in the offering plate, I love this as a kid, you put a couple coins in the offering plate, you just feel good. My dad would reach in his pocket and hand me a handful of coins and I just drop them in. It kind of feels good to give. Like, hey, that's kind of nice. Examine yourself, though. Go home and examine yourself. Check out what it is that you're holding on to and then hold firm to Christ for your salvation. And then if you're out of the faith, I want you to know it is not too late today. Because there will come a day when it will be. When you will be fully grown as a tear inside the field of wheat and the winnowers will come and you will be cast off. There will come a day when you grow so far And you look around at the people of faith around you and you say, how could they believe such elementary nonsense? And like Josh Harris, you'll throw your hands up and you will publicly leave and depart the faith. And when that happens, according to Hebrews, you're done. You've committed the unpardonable sin. You've walked away from the faith. Like, I believe in the grace of God. Like, like whatever, maybe, 
maybe there's like a half step out, half step in. I don't know. But I know this. I don't want to be playing that game. And I hate that there are people that are. Who are who've grown up. You've, you've been in the church 70 years. And you've grown up in the church. The church has grown up around you. And you look around at people of true faith. And you're like, I don't get it. I don't get why they think they should tell people about Jesus. Like, just let people live. Let people live. Like, if they want to follow Islam, okay, whatever. Let them live. If you're looking at the people of faith around you, questioning why they're weird, you're the tear in the situation. Looking up at the wheat, trying to figure out what the heck you're doing in the field. But you're here still. Praise God for that. There's a chance to become wheat. Examine yourself. Find if you're in the faith or not. And if you're not in the faith, today's the day to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Because God's offer for salvation is open to all who would believe. And if you're here today, you're not past the point of belief. So just as God offered through Christ salvation to all mankind, I want to offer that to you. Christ died for you. He rose again, conquering death in the grave so you could have victory now and in the future. And you can experience life eternal. Guys, guys, don't wait another month or two. And if you've been in the church, look, I did this, just so you know, my testimony is this testimony. Right? I got baptized when I was eight, seven, eight. Grew up in the church. I was looking around at the people around me who were actually believers. Like, man, they're kind of serious about this. But like, I did all the Christian y things. I was a very good tear. I was a very good tear. Looked very much like wheat. And I was not wheat. And then God, through the sovereignty of God and the grace of God, said, Matt, I'm going I'm to extend my hand to you again for the nine millionth time. Have faith in me. And something happened when I was 15 years old. It changed my life. I'm not who I was then. And a lot of us, I, I, I believe it to be true, there's a lot of people who are tares among the wheat. And guys, I don't want that to be your story. Because the end of the story is the winnowing and the separating. And I don't want any of y'all to be separated from me when it comes down to eternity. As your pastor, as someone who cares about every person in this room, I, I don't want you hell-bound because your pride refused to let you examine your salvation seriously today. Take the opportunity today, as long as it's called today, to examine yourself and to cry out for salvation. God is good to give salvation. Today we're actually going to taste and see that the Lord is good. We're going to celebrate communion, to remember the sacrifice of Jesus, the death, burial, resurrection of our Lord and Savior. It's a solemn thing that we do to remind us of that. It gets our senses involved to, 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 to feel taste, to touch, right, to, to, to have this connection with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. I'm asking my men, my deacons to come forward, and then I'm going to pray for us.